I'm glad because the fact as a founding, not just board member, but founding the actual nonprofit um, many, many, many years ago in the early 2000s, this was the dream that we had. We recognized there wasn't this type of local support in our area. We realized the need of it and it just wasn't getting met. And so we came together and we started at the time Alzheimer's Agency, which is now known as The Bridge, because we did want to bring people together and help bridge them to resources and supports. So this just so warms my heart to really be able to see this come into fruition and actually happening and helping folks in the community. So um, a little bit about myself. I am actually a gerontologist. Do y'all know what that is? Old folks. Yeah. Well, it's not the old folks. <laughs> it's the study of aging. Oh, okay. <laughs> or well, elderly. Because Jerry is that Latin word of elderly. So I am a gerontologist. I graduated from ULM. Um, I'm also a certified dementia practitioner. I am a former nursing home, national and state nursing home administrator, and have been working in long term care and with seniors since 1993. Um, my, my beginnings were in the institutional level of care and then God blessed me with a disabled child and I very much began to realize that I wanted him to have the opportunities and support to live, um, to live at home and to have support in his home and I wanted that for our seniors as well. So then um, God opened the door. I didn't even want to apply for the job. My aunt was going to send my resume in. I'm like, if you're going to do it, please don't send that resume because it's not good. But the Council on Aging, Bozier Council on Aging, was looking for an executive director a little over 11, almost 12 years ago now. And my aunt said, if you don't apply, I'm sending your resume for you. This is the job you need to be in. And on my birthday, I got the call and I got the interview. And now I am here and I am also the executive director of the Bozier Council on Aging. And what we do there is we provide what is called home and community-based services. So when I started on that track, it really opened the door for the knowledge for me of what we offer in our communities for seniors and their caregivers for home and community-based services. So this isn't just about the council and agents, it's about all home and community-based services that, be no, that may be available. And I recently got my notary public. And that was a task because I started that task before COVID and it kept getting drug out and drug out. But that is something that we are excited to offer in Bossier is free notary services for any of our clients that need it for signature only. So like if you need just your will notarized or power of attorney notarized, we offer that at no cost to our clients. So that's kind of a little bit about me. So you may be going, well, what is home and community based services? Um, lots of people know what hospital services are, or they know what home health may be. Um, but home and community-based services, according to seniorsforliving.com, encompasses any array of social and supportive services that may be provided in the home or even in a community center, like a senior center, or this is considered a home and community-based service. Some services are funded by government programs and may even be ministered through the local area agency on aging. And that is one of the things we are at the Council on Aging. So I think one thing that showed us through COVID is we need our social supports just as much as we need our medical, our financial supports, that kind of thing. So that is what home and community-based services touching on very lightly. But as we delve deeper, we're really gonna look at um, the wide range of stuff. So this is according to the Administration on Aging. It covers things that would allow individuals to remain in their community and their home. I'm gonna take a quick side note. How many of y'all here have children? At some point, yeah. Catch it. <laughs> um, when you were getting ready for that experience, and the men, it may have been a different experience than the ladies, but you probably were getting ready, you packed a bag, you were ready to go to the hospital, there was a lot of joy and excitement, and you knew you were coming home with a little baby. How many of y'all got your bags packed ready to go to the nursing home? <laughs> mm. Now, when we think about maybe going to the nursing home, what does that invoke in our minds? The end. The Bye. end, okay. Loss of freedom, mm -hmm. independence, loss mm. of choice. Mm -hmm. Institutional care can be very scary. I tell when I go out, I actually do a lot of advocating to our government because I am a government funded entity at the Council on Aging. 
state, federal, and local. So I go to federal people like Congress, I go to our state legislation, and in Bossier Parish, my police jury, my town councils. And the main thing I tell them is what we do in home and community-based service supports is we help keep seniors at home in their community. Because when you bought your home or your apartment or your condo, whatever it is that you live in, you probably thought about this is where I'm going to live till I die. My grandfather, for his 80th birthday, he was in a nursing facility for rehab. And he goes, I just want to go home for my birthday. That lake house in Canty, it's where I want to go. It's where I want to die. So for his 80th birthday, we got him out and we got him back home with supports. But that's where people want to be. You think about this is where I want my grandkids to come see me and visit me. This is where you want to live your life out. So when I talk to these elected officials, I say, that's what our job is, is to provide people with home and community-based services to support them in the community. Because our seniors, one, they're not as much of a tax burden on our community. They're not usually, you know, their homes or their income is usually very stable. It's not dependent upon a job. We do have some grandparents raising grandkids, but overall seniors aren't putting kids into school systems. Um, there are watchdogs of our community. So it's very important that we keep our seniors in our homes. Our community can't just be a bunch of young folks. We need a balance. So home and community-based services will include anything like home health care, which is a medical component of home and community-based service, personal care that may be helped with bathing, dressing, eating, preparing meals, grooming, health support services like housekeeping, shopping assistance, laundry, respite care, which is a caregiver relief program to give that caregiver a break so they can tend to their own needs, transportation, driving, and other routine chores that may be necessary to maintain that person's health, safety, and ability to stay in the home. Home delivered meals prepared at a central location is what one of the councils on aging things. That's what a lot of people think of when they hear about the council on aging is meals on wheels. But that's just one component of something that we do that helps support home and community-based services. But it's all about supporting the person's health, safety to stay in that home. So what is not home and community-based services? That nursing facility, that's institutional. A hospital, anything that's an institution for someone with mental disease, or even an immediate care facility for someone who has an intellectual disability. So why would you want or need, why would someone need this? Well, the first one is just to help them keep living independently. Might be just to help them with some of those things that they can't do. Maybe they can no longer drive. Where would it be if someone that we love would have had dementia why they couldn't drive anymore? And be a blessing to them. <laughs> but maybe because they've driven and gotten yeah. lost, they've gotten confused, they've gotten turned around. They're not aware of the safety, the, the reflexes slow down, that kind of thing. So having transportation support so they can still get out, but it's just getting from A to B, maybe the, mm -hmm. the safety risk and the concern for the family and even the person. Um, or maybe it's actually doing the shopping. Sometimes when someone with dementia, you know, maybe they have their list, but then when they get there, they're confused by the space they're in. They forget again why they got there. Um, handling the money and the transactions of the money. Is it cash? Is it checkbook? Is it debit card? Tending to their housekeeping. Now I'm going to kind of take a presumptuous guess here and figure that y'all either have dementia or are caring for someone with dementia. Is housekeeping an issue for those folks this at this time? <laughs> are, are you having to do the housekeeping for them? No, no, no. Okay. But just okay. <laughs> Um, one thing that we often see, and I was just talking with Paulette, another staff member here, uh, about a little project is it's not uncommon when we go into the person's home, because we do offer housekeeping at the Council on Aging, is, um, is to notice when we go in a senior's home, they might have a chair that they like to sit in. That's their go-to. Mine's my recliner at my house. And when you get there, you notice there's a lot of stuff right here piled up. Okay, maybe also by their bed. There's a lot of things piled up right there because it's like when they get up in the morning, they go to that chair, maybe the table in the kitchen where they tend to go and that's where they sit the day. That's where they basically live out their day and everything they need to function they have in just their little areas. And at first the staff was going, oh, they're cluttery. Oh, they're hoarding. And then we had a little exercise we did, which I know Paulette's going to look into that maybe we could do here at some point. 
And it was like eye opening after I did that exercise to go, it wasn't that they were hoarding or coloring, it was that this is how they were able to function and keep their things going that they knew each day when they got to this spot. Because we tend to get out of bed and we go either go to our table and have our coffee or go to the living room and watch the news. And they got here and they could look and go, oh, I need to do this today. Oh, I need to do this today. Oh, that's something I need to do today. And they just had their little life right there around their chair. So it wasn't that it was the house was dirty or it was cluttered in that spot, but kind of helping seniors with that. <clears throat> Helping with ADLs. So what IADL and ADL means, for those of y'all who, I don't like to do alphabet soup all the time, an IADL is an um, independent activity of daily living. So those are those things like we have on that list there, the shopping, the transportation, the housekeeping. And at ADL is an activity of daily living. So that is the things that you would do like your bathing, your cooking, your dressing, taking yourself to the bathroom if you're able, that kind of thing. So again, if someone needs those kind of things and if we can get that to them in the home, that's gonna help them stay in their home longer. To support caregivers, to help reduce the ER and hospital visits. Sometimes folks tend to wait until things are absolutely catastrophic and then show up in the ER and go, okay, this is what's going on now, help me. And if the ER and the hospital doesn't properly support and help you as a patient at that time, and you go home and come right back, whether it be the next day, the next week, whatever, they can actually have penalties and have their payments reduced for not effectively meeting that person's needs. So there is an incentive now on the commercial side for them to make sure that anybody that comes to the hospital or the ER and is a patient to identify, because sometimes it's, they just want to, I mean, you may feel like that, that you're just getting in there and they're just rolling you out. Do they really actually identify what was going on with you? Now they can only work with what they know. And I'm gonna say, it is having, we have over 4,000 clients that we serve. Our clients aren't always truthful, especially when they're maybe trying to kind of disguise some things. Because dementia in the early stages, you know, you know something's happening there. And you may be trying to make your notes, you keep your list, um, different little things to keep you on track, that kind of stuff. And so they don't wanna tell the hospital, well, I'm here because yeah, I'm diabetic, but I didn't take my diabetes medicine for 10 days. Well, one, if I don't realize they didn't take it for 10 days, because every time they thought to take it, they thought, oh, I already took it, and I don't need to take it again, and now I'm in the hospital because I haven't been taking my medicine right, because that hospital's gonna go, wait a second, you're not taking your medicine appropriately? Do you have your reminders? Do you have this? Is somebody coming to help you? I mean, do we need home help? No, but I don't want nobody coming in my home. So the hospitals now have a responsibility to because of these reductions in their payments, and we know commercially Elrod doesn't want reductions in payments. Oshner's doesn't want reductions in payments. Shumpert doesn't want reductions in payments. They want their money. That they don't want to have to have their payments reduced. They want to make sure they're setting you up appropriately for your discharge. So when we go out, we also talk to them about home and community-based services and how they can refer to us or to other agencies that we're going to get into. I want to go back to the support of caregivers. So oftentimes, depending on the stage of someone with dementia, family or friends, church, community is going to step in and become a caregiver in some way, shape, or form. And that person, as y'all may be, doesn't always know how to help. You help with what you know. Well, I see your yard hasn't been mowed. Can I help you mow your yard? I see your trash isn't going out. Do I need to take the trash can down for you? You haven't been to the grocery store. You need to pick up groceries while you're out. Or if you're a child, you know, mom, your lights were cut off. Or you got a collection notice in the, in the mail. So you sometimes step in where you, you see, but do we always know? So there was a client that we had, and they were married 75 years when his wife passed away. Married a long, long, long time. And he was taking care of his wife who had dementia. And they lived independently. He was her primary caregiver. Children were active as they thought they needed to be. There was no fault on the children because they were very much being told. And the picture they were seeing when they saw mom and dad and the grandkids, mom, my mom, papa, was very much nothing wrong. He's handling everything. So we were actually going out to their house once a week and providing some caregiver relief, four hours once a week to give him a little break. And they would come to our senior center. 
Now, as the case with most dementia, or a lot of dementia, not most, but a lot of dementia, there's these fine stages of physically, this person is on point. And as with him, his wife looked great. Makeup done, hair done, like she never left the house not looking good. Bless his heart, he may not. And she could get up. She outdanced the mayor of Benton out of his boots one day when we had a music <laughs> session. I heard y'all talk about the jam yeah. session. She loved it. Dance and dance. The mayor took his boots off to keep up with her. He was wore out, though, because physically he was literally chasing her all around. So one day, I go to give him a hug, and she's walking right by us. And as I gave him a hug, I smelled an odor. And it's not uncommon for someone with dementia to not like to take baths. And, and keep up with their hygiene. They just took a bath yesterday. Why do you want to make them take one today? I just did that this morning before you got here. Um, and I said, hey, is she not letting you bathe her? And he goes, why? Did you notice something? I said, well, when she walked by, I kind of noticed an odor. We could help with that. We we're coming out. He goes, it's not her, it's me. And I went, what do you mean? And he goes, well, I always have her sit on the toilet while I'm in the shower so I can talk to her and keep up with her. And two weeks ago, she didn't answer. And I looked out and she was gone. So I got out of the shower. I looked at the house and she wasn't there. So then I got dressed and I started looking for her. And she's down on the golf course. Mm -hmm. And he said, so I haven't taken a shower in two weeks. Oh, wow. oh my goodness. She looked great. He was suffering. He was self-neglecting to make sure her care was provided for. So thankfully though, home and community-based services was there. And I went, oh, wait, wait, wait a second. We're, we're certainly gonna try to support you better. Instead of coming one day for four hours, we're gonna split that into two two-hour visits. And the first thing you're gonna do when we get there is you're gonna go get you a shower. He goes, but I need my nap. <laughs> <laughs> Because I don't know if any of y'all are familiar, because bless their heart, when they come to the senior center, it kind of tired her out a little bit. But then that sundowning kicked in, mm -hmm. and he had to be ready to go. So mm -hmm. he would take a little nap and get ready for that sundowning that was coming. But that's how we kind of helped out, is we changed their time. He started getting his shower twice a week. But we also called the family, and we alerted the family, because now we're an extra set of eyes. We're home and community-based service. We're in there seeing the family said we see him at church there's never a problem they're both you know well don't know if he was well kept but they both they show up on time they enjoy us we go out to eat we go out to eat twice a week with them i said have y'all been to the house lately no because papa always meets us out daddy always says i'm in town let's meet that was his tactic to keep them from coming to the house mm -hmm. to really see what was going on so us being in there, we were able to bring in family and they were very concerned. Like I said, that they, they were there as much as they thought they needed to be until then we alerted because they were wanting to keep their independence and he wanted to take care of his bride and he was doing a great job with what he could do. He only had just so much ability, skill set, <clears throat> knowledge. So no fault to him, but he just needed a little extra help. So that's how we can help support caregivers. So again, kind of going back to what I just said, by default, most patients or family caregivers, they perform a significant amount of time on their own because they're primarily focused on keeping this other person well. And they do this, like I just said with this gentleman, without maybe the skills, the tools, or the knowledge that clinicians may have. And I'm not trying to say clinicians to get into a medical term. I don't think of myself or my staff as clinicians, but we do work and support in that healthcare, uh, home and community-based service area. So there's a couple of different things. This might where y'all might want to take notes. And I always tell people, don't always think that something isn't just for you because you never know where God puts you for a reason on what day and what time. So there may be things that you hear or learn about today that's going to help benefit somebody else down the road. You're going to go, I heard something about this at something. And, and you're going to remember, it'll come to you in the shower maybe, but you'll remember. <laughs> so the waivers. When people, does anybody know what a waiver is here? Okay, what do you know about a waiver? I'm tired from Medicaid. Awesome, girl. So you know what this means, don't you? Mm -hmm. Tell us what this means in your world. That means that you have to wait six years. Some of the waiting lists for the different programs are six years long. Oh. 
There's just mm. not enough slots because nursing homes want all the millions They do. Of that's the sad thing. That's the that's the hard part. So I say this to add to her. Don't be deterred by the waiting no, list, though. But, because there is a way to get around it. There is. There is a way. And, people don't and, and the other thing mm -hmm. is, is people you say to, to get into a nursing no, home? No, no. Okay, For what I fix to talk about home and community-based oh, service. Oh, okay, okay. Uh, I'll go back. <laughs> so there's waivers from the Department of Health, which is Medicaid, um, different things like that. And I'm going to say, but don't be deterred by the waiting list, because often people know, and I'm so glad you're able to say that, and, and thank you for your time with the state and with Medicaid, is people go, well, I heard about the waiting list, but I heard there's a six-year waiting list. I'm never going to get my needs met. But that's the thing. If you are qualified, and we're going to go over some of the qualifications, and you don't get on the waiting list now, what's going to happen in three or four years when you really, really need it? You know, there's there's always, always with government, there's loopholes. <laughs> so we're going to go over a little bit of that, okay? But yes, that is what a lot of people think when they hear waivers. No, no way. I've mentioned I have a special needs son. He was on a waiting list for eight years. But I tell you what, God provides. I had just started a new job, and I was in Baton Rouge attending something, and they told me about making a phone call, and I called, and they were like, well, we sent you this. I'm like, no, you didn't, because I keep everything. I said, actually, the letter you sent me, I have it. And it says, blah, blah, blah. Well, can you give us that? I sure can. I emailed it. You're back on the waiting list. And I got a call two months later. His number was up. And he got services. Mm -hmm. And my son still gets services today through the waiver. And that's how I'm able to do my job and be active in the community and function and support the community is because of his waiver. But we did have to wait eight years. <laughs> but that was a long time ago. So there's different waivers. One is called community choice, and these income amounts may have changed a little bit. I actually have some updates I just got yesterday or this morning, but this kind of gives you a ballpark, okay? Now, these are things under Medicaid. So Medicaid is an income-based program. It's not Medicare, okay? So the community choice services elderly and disabled adults. There are some income requirements there. And the community choice waiver, and you certainly correct me if I'm wrong on this, as with any waiver, it allows you a budget to hire someone to help the individual, whether it's you or like with me, my son, or maybe it's a sister or your mom or dad, your spouse, to then care for them so you can continue, whether it's a job, your own life, whatever it may be, okay? You get set a budget. Um, it used to be before COVID, you could work with an agency and they would help you find staff. It's really hard to find staff now. Mm -hmm. um, actually, because of COVID, the law now says you can actually even hire family members. That used to be a no-no, but now you can actually pay a family member to help take care of someone. Um, because of the positivity of that option of COVID, there is discussion of LDH allowing that past covid guidelines being lifted um, because the waiting list is still there and they know that even though like you said after what was your name virginia miss virginia that even though the nursing homes try to they want these people to stay in dollar for dollar as taxpayers it's cheaper for us to have our folks at home right. than in a nursing home okay. they're paying fifty five six thousand dollars a month and we could maybe take care of someone at home for less than five hundred dollars with the right supports if that's all they need so this is one of the programs, Community Choice. There's the one that's called Long-Term Personal Care Waiver. This was actually the most underutilized up until a couple of years ago, maybe five. And then it really got a push. And they were like, this is where we have some money. This is where we don't have waiting lists. And then the tide kind of shifted, as with any tide, things shift, you know. But the Long-Term Personal Care Waiver is eligible for someone who has Medicaid and so these bullets over here on the your left are ones that all of them have to be met. They must be on Medicaid and be 21 or older. Now we typically know someone with dementia is usually older than 21. I think we discussed recently like the youngest case is maybe someone in their 40s. So we know we're going to have that checked with someone with dementia. Meet nursing facility level of care. So it doesn't mean they're in a nursing facility. It means they are care must meet that need for nursing facilities. So it may be that you went to the doctor's visit and the doctor said, hey, mom needs to be in a nursing home because she needs someone cooking her meals. 
she needs someone bathing her and she can't drive anymore and she's forgetting her medicines well she's meeting nursing facility level of care and require we talked about at least one activity of daily living so that's bathing cooking and either be able to direct their own care or through a responsible representative so like with my son now he's not on this one but i'm his responsible representative not someone with dementia could probably not direct their own care under a waiver and then they must meet one of these other ones either be in a nursing home and be able to go home with if they had supports or be possibly they might probably need to go in a nursing home or if they have someone who their primary caregiver is disabled or at least 70 years old. That's going to be your couples usually right there because a married couple is, you know, they're both elderly. So this is the long-term personal care waiver qualifications. So what they can do, and it talks about what is not covered. Actually, nursing care in a nursing home. That's what's not covered. This is not to get you in a nursing home. This is to help keep you at home. The skilled nurses rehab therapy somebody doing therapy services specialized aid like it's not a cna because again it could be maybe the spouse is the caregiver and they're going to be the ones that, that provide the care under that um so again i think this is the help that's already being given um oh through another assistance program because sometimes people will be on like the va aid in attendance and they can also co-qualify so you wouldn't be able to do that under this one was my understanding. Um, cleaning areas of the home that the person doesn't stay in. So this is where, and again, people go, well, how are they gonna know this? The program is designed to set up and support the person that's the client. So like with my son, they can help him or clean for him, his room, his bathroom, it's his area. I can't tell them to go clean my room. That's not what they're there for, okay? Um, do food and prep for laundry that's anyone besides the client. Again, they can prepare my son's dinners. They can help him with his laundry. But I can't go, hey, the family's coming over. I need you to cook the turkey for Thanksgiving dinner. <laughs> you know, they're there for my son. This would be the same as if someone um, under the long-term care service. What is covered? Helping with those activities of daily living. Helping them bathe, get dressed, making sure they're dressed appropriately, make sure they have eat. Outside walking, stimulation, physical activity, keeping them active, mobile, doing light housekeeping like we identified over on the other side, helping them prep meals. They could do shopping for them, um, do laundry, remind them about taking medicines, maybe help them get to appointments, make an appointment, um, help get transportation. So in looking at just this, not even worry about the long-term care waiver, how many of y'all are doing this for someone right now? Yeah. <laughs> I'm not talking about yourself, but you might be yeah. helping somebody else with this. Yeah. So I think we're going to get to this slide. I have multiple different, different PowerPoints. But these are the things that sometimes people don't realize. I do this, and therefore I'm a caregiver. And these mm -hmm. are the things that when you're doing these for other people, you're a caregiver. So I talk about this program because I'm going to go back to what I said earlier. I'm telling you about some things that might not apply to you specifically, but PACE is a program we don't have in our area up here. It's in Louisiana, but uh, any of y'all ever get into politics? Oh, you don't have to be a politician, but like you keep up with politics maybe. A lot of things in Louisiana happen down south along I-10 and we never get them up here. <laughs> this is one of those programs that's happening down south. Um, but the PACE program is for all-inclusive care for elderly. And it, you must qualify 55 years or older, live in a PACE provider service area, like I said, which is not here, but there are some down South Louisiana. Um, again, be certified to need nursing level of care, be Medicaid eligible, make no more than a certain amount of income for uh, individuals and couples. And do you know more about the PACE, Miss Virginia? I do, I know very little about okay. it. Okay. Because I'm retired, but I, I mean, I keep up with policy. Yeah. I keep a manual on my computer, but I, I know very little. Yeah, and that's the thing is, I don't I don't know a lot about it because we don't have it up here yet, right. but I have had instances where people go, oh yeah, my cousin's in that down in Baton Rouge or, or whatever. So it's something, it may get our way eventually, because it's kind of, and I'm not going to say, oh, because somebody goes, oh, it's on a trial. And I'm like, it's not on a trial. It's been around for more yeah. than 10 years. It just haven't, hasn't made its way up here yet. I think it's because the way it's ran, because it's ran like a managed care insurance company, kind of, through mm -hmm. Medicaid. Mm -hmm. And 
it's just kind of a different little cubby of this, but I don't want to not mention it because if and when it ever comes. Um, so again, with this, how is PACE paid? Kind of like I said, it's through Medicare and Medicaid. Mm -hmm. If you're enrolled in the PACE program, you're basically taking your Medicare and Medicaid and you're assigned it to that PACE provider. And they oversee all of your medical, home and community-based services, everything. The folks that are on it down in South Louisiana, I've talked to about a dozen of them over the course of six years. They like it. They make one phone call. They have a caseworker. I need this done. Da, 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 da. That person coordinates everything. It might take a couple of days. And then they get the different folks in line for what they need, whether it's I need to get a doctor's appointment. Okay, let me find a doctor who, who's in your network. They kind of handle all of that. So these waiver services, if you are eligible for Medicaid, your loved one may be eligible for Medicaid, or maybe there's someone, like I said, down the road that you encounter, would be done through the Office of Community Services. I'm sorry, that's another board of one. Office of Citizens with Developmental Disabilities. That's what OCDD stands for. Their phone number is right there. These are all the parishes that this branch serves, okay? So those are the ones that oversee the actual waiver once you're on <clears throat> Medicaid. This is not how you get on Medicaid. This is just once you're on Medicaid and you want to get into the waivers. I feel like you're about to say something, go ahead. Uh, I'm, I'm confused because I had talked to them recently um, and um, they said they don't provide services for people over, what was it, 50, 55? Over 50, okay. And that may be something they have changed because um, they oh, used no, to um, be over it all used of them. To be, uh, that it was just for um, the people with dis uh, disability, developmental disabilities that were over 21, but under the uh, age category, Okay. disability category. Because see, they used to oversee the LTCS or the LTPCS and the Community Choice, which are both elderly waivers. Okay. So, um, yeah. yeah. What I, what I call and like it. I said, the thing with the LTPCS, the long-term care one, it was so underutilized years ago. And then we started talking about, and I don't mean like we, like as a, as a state, it yeah. really started getting the push. And I think it was one of those programs that kind of was like, well, who's going to oversee it? And the Office of Aging Support was like, not us. And then OCDD was already set up because they do all the other waivers, the now, the road, the community choice, all these other. And so they they were told they had to kind of take it. But I will follow up with them and make sure. So, but if someone is on Medicaid, though, you could ask your Medicaid provider, I'm interested in a waiver. I think my person or me or whomever might qualify and they can get you connected. So what kind of supports are there for seniors and their caregivers? The Council's on Aging. So every parish has a Council on Aging. So a little history lesson or fun fact. That does that mean how many Councils on Aging do we have in the state? 64. That's right, because we have 64 parishes. <laughs> so that is something that our legislation did right back in the 70s, is they said we want people to have a local entity they can go to and not have to trek all the way to Baton Rouge or all the way to Shreveport from wherever to get supports. Every parish has a council on aging. But the same, are they the, the same benefits at every identical benefits? They're a little different and we'll go over that because every council does things a little bit differently. But we're going to kind of go over the gist of it and then each council you may call and go, hey, I need supports for seniors. What do y'all offer kind of thing? So qualifications for every council though is you must be 60 live in that parish, don't have support for what you're asking for, and then priority is given to clients within a lowest socioeconomic support. Now, that doesn't mean you have to be low income to get it. And that's often the thing that I get when I do go out is people go, well, I don't qualify, I make too much money. That's not what that says. What is that first word there? Priority. Priority. That just means that if I have client A that makes this much money and his score is a 20 and this client here makes $800 less and their score is a 20, priority will be given to the person with the lower income. That's all it means. It does not mean that you have to be below a certain income to get services from us. Um, so what the councils do is the one in information and assess, assist with referrals because just like here at the bridge, it may not be that the council does everything, 
but they can get you connected. We refer to the bridge with people. We have our clients that have dementia or their caregivers are dealing with that. They may call us for utility bill assistance. We don't do that. We give them the phone number of that who does. They may call us for, um, I need help with my prescription plan. It's end of the year, it's time to look at my prescription plan. We refer them over to the um, Caddo Council for the Aging Disability Resource Center. So we do that. We are home delivered meals. Often people refer to it as Meals on Wheels. We offer legal services. We offer transportation. We do that across the whole parish, medical appointments, um, in Bossier, that kind of thing. They offer homemaker services, caregiver support. That may be through a sitter program, some kind of respite, and often material aid like blankets, fans, medical equipment, and continent supplies. So every council will offer all of these in some way, shape, or form, okay? Some councils will actually put money and buy material aid items. Some rely just on donations of that. Um, transportation may be they only transport to their senior center, or transportation may be that they go to the senior center, the grocery store, the library, the doctor's appointments, the casinos, whatever. So how they do it is going to vary, but they're going to do some version of all of these, okay? Any questions on any of that? Okay. Um, at senior centers throughout the whole state, like we said, there's a senior center in every parish. Some councils may have one, they may have multiples. At the senior center, you're gonna find recreation. You're gonna find wellness, exercise programs. You're gonna find a lunch. The minimum requirement is that they must, and GOEA is the Governor's Office of Elderly Affairs, so I actually work under the governors who I work under. They must be open at least five days a week for four hours a day, and then offer five of those services that we saw, okay? A meal site or a satellite site might just be a meal and maybe an activity or exercise. This could actually be a satellite site for Cattle Council on Asian if they wanted to, and they could offer a meal and count this as an activity, and they would be able to be considered a satellite site. Um, Recreation is things like crafts, bingo, games, wellness, exercise, yoga. Some places have swimming pools, water aerobics. But the thing that it is not, is not a medical care facility. Sometimes you may hear, oh, I'm taking my mom to the adult daycare. Any of y'all ever heard of those? Mm -hmm. Anybody use one of those? Not yet. Try to. Try to? Okay. And there they usually have a nurse or a CNA that might give medicines and that kind of thing, right? That's not what a council on aging is. That's not what a senior center is. It is a day center. It does not mean that someone with some dementia can't come, but each council does look at how they can handle and um, serve those seniors individually. Us personally, we had someone that as they were phasing through their dementia, we had no issues, no issues, no issues. And the person started needing help with one of those activities of daily living, toileting. Mm -hmm. And being able to toilet appropriately and clean themselves and that kind of thing. And all we did is just let the family know, we love having them, but they might just need somebody here with them because we don't have the staff. We don't do that kind of medical care as far as activities of daily living. All right, no problem. This one's coming this day, this grandkid's coming this day, and I say grandkid, I don't mean the little four-year-old, I mean the 20-year-old grandkid that's all from college on Tuesdays was coming, you know. So they supported them and continued to come because they had been coming for like 15 years. And I'm sure y'all know with someone with dementia, when they have consistency like that and a routine and a plan and they're familiar and you take it away rather than support, that can really rock their world even worse sometimes. Mm -hmm. So it was awesome that this family was able to recognize that and just, and us too, as a provider go, we're not just saying they can't come, we just need to find a better way to support them because we don't offer those supports. So support for nutritional needs, because oftentimes when we're working with someone with dementia and even their caregivers, some of the first things that we see go is the eating. One, because they think they already ate. The hunger goes, I'm hungry, they walk in the kitchen, why am I in here? Or oftentimes with dementia, sometimes that recognition of that hunger pain diminishes. They don't realize they're hungry. So we have some different supports. Um, and some of these things to again remind y'all, may not apply to you personally, but if there is someone who's in that early stages and they're still living on their own and maybe they're on these limited incomes, 
that some of these may, may be able to support them and some of them may not. So the first thing that we look at is, does the person actually qualify for SNAP benefits? Maybe, because oftentimes with dementia, especially early stages, maybe there's a lot of medicines they're on. They can't afford that. Maybe they're struggling with, you know, making sure in their budget, as we're budgeting our monthly bills, that they're keeping money for food. Well, if we get them on SNAP, all right, got about 10 minutes, that we have some money for food each month. Um, looking at food box programs, there are some programs that actually deliver food straight to the house. So that way they're not having to go to the store and get some stuff. Um, we actually are dealing with our neighbor right now who is having some concerns and some issues with dementia. And her issue is she goes out to the store and she comes home with just enough food for like that moment, that day. And then the next day it's again and again. And the family's concerned that she's having to go out so often and, and they're worried about that. And then the cooking, because one time she went to the store, she thought she was already cooking the food, left the oven on. And then when she came back an hour later, there was issues in the kitchen. Um, home delivered meals, like we talked about, actually getting the meals out to folks. And again, there's no income limit on that. Um, and Super Saturday, some churches do stuff. And some local churches even do things like with our seniors. They'll have the, the church groups that get together. I know um, they have like the senior uh, Sunday school classes that meet on a certain day and they'll do luncheons and stuff. So also supports for veterans. Any veterans in here? Awesome, okay. So sometimes I find, and my grandfather was guilty of this, he was a veteran, and I was like, you have served our country, and you have benefits available, and you don't want to take them, and his stuff said was, and I guess maybe it's a veteran thing, there might be someone who needs it more than me. And I'm like, but do you realize that if even if they need it and you need it, you both get it? So this is information that was based from the U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs. So there is a program called VA Aid in Attendance. So these were the dates that you must have been honorably discharged with at least 90 days of continuous service. Doesn't mean you actually went over and served, but just you had 90 days of continuous service with one of any of those following dates there. And most veterans know if they're eligible or served in certain times. So the aid in attendance, what it does is it will actually increase the veteran's pension amount for them to be able to hire and pay for someone to help them in their home. So there's of course some qualifications. Now their qualifications um, are different from Medicaid. And sometimes when I talk to people, they go, I was already turned down for Medicaid, I'm never gonna get it. It's not Medicaid, it's the VA. You could qualify for the VA and never qualify for Medicaid and that's okay. So their qualifications there are like, you must uh, require the aid to perform certain duties, must be maybe be bedridden, maybe you're already in a nursing facility, but you're wanting to go home, eyesight issues, that kind of thing. But what's that top line say? Spouse. Spouse. A lot of people don't realize their spouse can get support too. Mm -hmm. They think it's just for the veteran only. Mm -hmm. So they do have some income guidelines, but it's a lot higher <laughs> than Medicaid. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So the homebound allowance, like I said, it increases the pension to what you're already getting to then um, when you're confined to your immediate premises. And the thing is the veteran or even the surviving spouse may not receive aid and attendance at the same time though. So the surviving spouse can get it, but not the same time the veteran's getting it, okay? There is support for utility assistance. And I talk about this because sometimes it's about the budget and the money. Where do we gonna have this? And oftentimes we'll go, well, why would you tell us about this if, if, if we make too much? I said, because maybe it's that you look at the person individually and if you can free up some of their money, maybe they have money to even hire caregivers or pay someone to help with a little something. So there are some utility programs out there. LAHEAP is the main one and they give priority to our elderly. Now this was last year's incomes. Um, I haven't seen this year's yet, but uh, as with our government right now, everything's kind of delayed. But I know that the agencies that do this do have updated incomes. They can get them at once every six months. So twice a year, someone can get help with utility bills. Um, they can be split even. Maybe someone has you know, gas and electric or whatever, they can be split. And also with these is they must have their actual disconnect notice. And again, I had a lady in a conference and she's like, 
I have mom's disconnect notice in my purse. I'm going to pay it. And I was like, go to your local agency first. And she was just like, wow. So not always something to not, not consider. Um, up here, we have the power to care, which is Entergy. They can actually get up to $600 a year and it's $200 at one payment. Some seniors don't even have a $200 bill, but if they got a $200 credit, that might carry two, three, maybe four months. If that's one less thing somebody has to worry about, cutting a check for, writing something, that's awesome that we've just taken that off their list of to-dos. With SWEPCO, it's the Neighbor Net to Neighbor program. So under Medicare, there is supports for those with disabilities, and that is gonna be through our Aging Disability Resource Center. They can help with things like prescription assistance, looking at your medicines every year, making sure you're in the right prescription plan. Has anybody got caught up in the issue of your prescription plan change at the beginning of the year and you mm -hmm. didn't know it? <laughs> That's why they tell us to look at it every year. But um, Caddo Council on Aging does this, and it's free. Um, they can look at your Part D plans, they can help refer and make sure you have health and social supports, support families, streamline the eligibility. You mentioned, Virginia, that sometimes there's you can advance on stuff just because of waiting list. You might actually be further along than you realize because of your needs. They can help with that. Um, and they actually can target individuals who are looking to be institutionalized. Even though we said that, yes, there is a big push for individual, the nursing homes to they want to keep their uh, residents but we know, and especially with COVID, as I say, there's always blessings in the COVID chaos that having people at home is still better than having an institution. Um, and they can ensure that all clients understand what their long-term care options are. It's not to say that institutional, inst institutionalization may not be a final outcome. Sometimes families can only support to so much, but supporting someone in their home as long as they can safely and securely, then that's what we want to try to do. Talks about the prescription program. There might be free medicine that's available. Um, especially, I think the gap is actually going away another year. Um, again, the local uh, Aging Disability Resource Center is the Cattle, Out, Cattle Council on Aging, and they serve all of the parishes up here. And just like with the councils on aging, there's a council in every parish. There is a ADRC that serves all regions of the state. So if, you're, if your brother lives in Monroe and he needs help with his prescription plan, there's an Aging Disability Resource Center over there. So I actually just got this email today and it's on the Medicare Savings Plan and Low Income Subsidy. They uh, just updated the Low Income Subsidy part of it. And so if you wanna make notes. And what this does is it helps pay part of your B or D premium if need be, or even um, well, if you're on your A, you're on your credits. So the Medicare savings plan helps pay both, B and D. You have to be below a certain income. This income did change too, but they didn't send me that one yet. They just sent me the low income one yet, this one. Um, but basically it gives your recipient about a hundred something dollars back in their pocket every month because you're not having to pay your B premium or your D. Now the low income subsidy, and I think that's gonna be on slide. Page is it? Page 11. Those amounts went up to 8,400 a, uh, a year. So that's a yearly amount, that's not a monthly amount. That's on the individual? Yes. Okay. So that's a year, so we have to break that down. No, is that right? Mm -hmm. It says, per the methodology, the resource limit may not exceed for full low income, increases it to 8,400 or 12,600 if married. Oh, that's true. So this right here. And then it says the resource limit must not be exceeded for partial more than 14 and 27,950. This is what it is. So this amount is now $14,010. And then the couple income for the year, and then the couple is 27,950. So that's what the resource limits went up to in this year. So this number now is 27,950, and this one is 14,010. And then you can divide that by 12 and get your monthly kind of, that's your resource limits. 
And those are really good because sometimes people don't realize that they qualify for that and it just puts money right back in your pocket. My mom didn't realize she qualified. She lives in Texas, but Medicare is federal. So I said, mom, you make enough that you could actually get these things paid for. She goes, no, I can't. I'm like, give me your laptop, let's apply. And so she gets more money back in her pocket and gets her Part B and her Part D paid for. But this one is also through the state uh, Medicaid, so. Yeah, because it does partner you up, yeah. <clears throat> and they're getting better about actually connecting you. For the longest time, you had to apply separately and you wouldn't connect. But Medicaid is getting better about when you apply for Medicaid yeah. and you are on Medicaid, they automatically connect you to this. But sometimes this is how we can get people to realize they qualify for Medicaid. Because some people don't realize they qualify for Medicaid. And then we show them this and they go, oh, well, I make less than that. I can get that. And then they actually end up being qualified for Medicaid. Um, again, if someone's living on their own and we're looking at different things, rental assistance um, through different housing, um, low-income rent-based, the action agency. And sometimes, I've seen this only in like the very, very early, early, early stages of dementia. Maybe someone's in their home and it's just kind of getting to be too much and we see some little things are slipping. If we can convince them to maybe downsize, maybe they move into a senior housing, not talking assisted living or, or, or anything like that, but maybe a low income rental where there's a community around them and they watch each other and they support each other. It's a smaller environment for them to have to support and they can be supported through um, rental assistance. So in summary, why do we utilize? Why should we utilize home and community-based services? Because it's just the right thing to do. We want to stay home. We, we want to live in our environment that we created. Mm -hmm. It's for those that we serve, whether it be your family, you as the caregiver, the actual individual themselves. And again, for personal, it's our tax dollars. When someone goes to that institution, that's just more and more and more money. When we can serve people in their homes, it's less money in us on a tax dollar. Um, and then, I, like I said, come from the heart part of it. My son, I'm making every effort to try to support him in his home with the right supports, with the waivers, um, with food stamps. I am utilizing a lot of this for my son. He's, a, he's over 20 now, semi-independent, but I'm doing all of these things to support him, no different than when my grandmother had dementia and we were trying to support her. And it's just the right thing to do. Do I have any questions? I, I do. Yes. The services that y'all provide at um, Council on Aging, mm -hmm. or is there a requirement, and you may have said this, but I didn't catch it. <clears throat> is there a requirement for the number of days that the participant um, goes? I mean, no. They can go at one day a week or one mm -hmm. day a month? Mm -hmm. um, so, with the council's aging, it would definitely talk to the different centers because if they provide transportation, they might have some guidelines on making them aware of when they're coming or whatever. But I have clients that drive themselves, so I have clients that their family members drop them off and then maybe we just take them home. Um, but no, again, it's not like a day center, I mean a, a day care program. We are not paid by insurance, we're not paid by Medicaid or Medicare, so we're not waiting on that. We need a certain census. They need to be coming a certain many days a week so we can get that reimbursement rate. That's not how we work. I tell people all the time, remember the rec centers back when you were younger and you got out of school or in the summertime, you went and you played ball and maybe they served you hot dogs and you ran around and played with your friends and that's what a senior center is like. It's a place where you come with your friends, they feed you, you fellowship, you chit chat and, and you just have fun. Um, every council's calendars are going to be a look a little different because, I mean, even in Bossier, we have three that are operating right now, and my Plain Demon one is very different than my Bossier one, and it's very different than the Houghton one, you know, because different areas of the parish, they, they like to do different things. Um, but there is no minimum requirement per the state guidelines. Um, adult day health care centers. Mm -hmm. uh, Y'all used to provide that service, didn't you? Not us at the council. Okay. Um, Red River Council on Aging does have an adult day okay. program, but they um, operate under Medicaid. They're still not opening up, back up yet? Um, okay, so and what you may have been I thinking about, Miss Virginia. Success. Yeah, so what you may have been thinking about is Volunteers of America operated, I'm sorry, actually it started out as Krista Shumpert. They operated an adult day program that was 
over at the building at Caddo Council on Aging on Buckner. Oh, okay. okay, but it was ran through <clears throat> Shumpert. Shumpert sold it to Volunteers of America. Volunteers of America moved it to Knight Street. Okay. And it did close down with COVID. And my understanding is that that adult day program is not reopening well, at this they time. Told me, but uh, mm -hmm. success is the one that I've had contact with, and they said, "Do you does your sister still need the services?" And I was like, "Yes," but I've never. You know, so where are they based out of? You know, I mean, that is uh, on Han Street. It's in in the North Street Port. Okay, okay. Mm -hmm. I'm area. familiar with that. We actually have a client that we bus there <clears throat> oh, okay. and stuff. So yeah, we we again we just provide the transportation for them to get there. And everything, but so um, they, were, they are open again. I don't know if they're open yet because so, I don't think we've started her uh, yet. Yeah, yeah. They haven't contacted me in a while. It's like, yeah. Mm. And that's certainly something I would encourage y'all, um, because even something like that, that's going to be funded through Medicaid. And if that's something that's important to y'all, as we are coming out of COVID and y'all feel secure and support, contact your legislators and be like, hey, this program needs to get back started because I can tell you that sometimes programs go. There's not a need for it anymore. We don't need it. Shut it down. And the legislators go, okay, well, we haven't heard that nobody wants it. So we'll stop the funding. And they listen to Louisiana Department of Health and they take the money wherever they want it and they put it to their projects. So if it's something that means a lot to you, reach out to your legislators and go, I need it. I want it. Put it back. Keep it going. We'll fix the start legislation next week. <laughs> so, um, my sister would be private pay because their assets, countable assets, okay. are over the threshold. And I, I do believe that uh, with all the waiver programs that a spousal impoverishment can be applied. Also, where the spouse mm -hmm. that's not on Medicaid or not applying gets to keep, uh, I think, $130,000, $7,000 or seven. So, do you know, and I'm asking because you did work there, does spousal impoverishment apply if they're both still in the home? I believe so. Okay. I'll go and I'll check in the policy okay. manual, but I believe it does. Okay. Because what Miss Virginia is talking about is if you have a husband and wife, normally a husband and wife are looked together as the same income. But traditionally, if let's say the wife needs to go in the nursing facility and the husband's still at home, Medicaid says we're not going to impoverish the spouse and make them pay six thousand dollars a month and their total income's only Maybe they bring in together three thousand. That's typically more than what you could make for Medicaid. But do they have to sell the house, do deplete their savings? And Medicaid says the spouse can keep up to like a hundred. I think it's one hundred twenty now. I, I um, thought it was one hundred thirty-seven. Okay, it may be up to that now. I think okay. it went up this year. Yeah. So that would just be my question: Is does spousal impoverishment apply when they're both at home, utilizing home and community-based services? I think so, but okay. I, I, I mean, I can check and see. Yeah. Um, Okay. But also, does does Medicare pay if you have Medicare and a supplement, mm -hmm. like a they, Medigap plan? What do do they pay for uh, home health care services? Medicare does pay for home health, so yes. you don't have to necessarily then worry about because most. I mean, I feel like most of the this group right here won't qualify for Medicaid, and and patient. maybe not. Um, so, um, I'm just wondering if that's an option. So just remember, have any of y'all ever utilized home health in here? Anybody had to have home health or had, okay. So the thing I say about home health, y'all, is home health is not something you can set your watch by, okay? Because okay. um, home health, gotta love them. They're coming into people's homes to serve them. So that nurse may come to your house at eight o'clock and you're a diabetic. I'm not trying to pinpoint anything on you, sir. But you're not. A, you're a diabetic, and you didn't take your your stuff for the past two days. And she walks in, and your stuff is crazy. So her 30 minute for visit for you is now two and a half hours of getting your stuff straight. Mm -hmm. So now her 8:45, her nine, and each person keeps getting bumped. So sometimes, and my grandmother was guilty of this. Home health supposed to be here at eight or at ten. They're not here. What's going on? What's going on? <laughs> I had another appointment. I'm going to miss this. And I was like, remember they're not you may not always get them at the exact same time at the exact same day every day same with the therapists that they provide or the cnas so so home health is not something you can count on a hundred percent of the time and they're not every day all day either so people sometimes go oh well, i need a sitter so i'm gonna get home health to come in they're not sitters mm -hmm. um they're there to help you with medical services you might need so yeah but yes medicare does cover home health yes but but 
whole and community-based services? No. Okay. Because Medicare is meant to provide medically okay. necessary services. And what did we learn about home and community-based services today? Mm -hmm. They're not the medical. Right. They're the social okay. and other supports. Yes, ma'am. You said you had three senior centers open in Bossier? We do have three senior centers in Bossier. I was wondering where those were. So we have Bossier City on Bearcat Drive. Oh. And we have our Plain Dealing location mm -hmm. at the Kerry Martin Center. And we actually have Houghton. We're doing a split because anybody know Bossier? Houghton's kind of weird out there. <laughs> you have Houghton <laughs> proper. And mm -hmm. then you have what we call the Houghton Parish, which is along 80. So we actually, and then there's a Princeton pie, I call it, right? They're cutting it in half. Um, so we have our Houghton proper um, center, which is um, right in the parking lot at the First Baptist Church Houghton at the Mason Lodge. Oh. And then so on, that's on week, one week. And then the next week we're at Legacy Baptist Church, which is out on Highway 80. But we do have a website. All of our activity calendars are on our website as well. And it shows the days, what activities. And like I said, what Plain Dealing is doing is not the exact same thing Bearcat's doing. And even at Houghton, what they're doing on at the Houghton Lodge or the Mason Lodge may not be the same thing they're doing at the church because it's just different <coughs> service areas and stuff. Do you know anything about the Caddo? Uh, uh huh. So um, Caddo actually does partner a lot with the SPAR parks, the Streetport Parks and Recreation. Mm -hmm. They have, um, I know they have the Randall T. Moore Center that they were up with, and they also had a few other centers that they were doing at housing units like um, different apartment complexes. Mm -hmm. Those centers were up and going because they were kind of self-run by the residents who live like in um, Canaan Towers, that kind of thing. I don't know if they have Randall T. Moore open yet. Um, I am putting a meeting together with all the directors in this region at the end of this month so we can all kind of come together because it's been hard. It really has. Um, being under the governor's office, we've been definitely under direction via him and sometimes there's some leniencies that you know other people get that we don't because we're under the his office and stuff but our main goal has just been to support and make sure our seniors are safe and everything but yeah that's our three i don't have my benton site open yet because i am looking for a site manager but i do have a location in benton as well and they're anxious they're ready to go so if y'all know anybody in benton that's looking for a job, I got a job. <laughs> <laughs> any other questions well, Paulette knows how to reach me. Um, and again, y'all can reach me at the Bossier Council on Aging. And I hope that in some way, it may not be everything under the home and community-based services, but there is supports out there in some different ways. And even if it's just a little piece that maybe helps your puzzle get complete, and, um, and, and then you can maybe get some more help and support. And as this journey goes, I'm glad y'all are here at the bridge and we'll get across it together. One last okay. question. Uh, Do you have to be a, can you participate in the, the Bossier activities without, if you're a Caddo resident? So what we say at my location in Bossier is anybody can come play with us, but in order for us to serve you, you must live in our parish. Okay. So anybody can drive over, hang out. We do an assessment. It don't matter where you live, but if I need to deliver a meal to you or, or come to your house for housekeeping or pick you up, take you to doctor, you have to live in Bossier Parish. So yeah. And we used to do dances, and we're trying to get dances back. Some people like to do dances. That was my question. <laughs> Did you come to my dances? Yeah, oh yeah. Oh, oh. We're working on it. We're working on it. Yes. So April first, April first is our target date. Okay. Oh, okay. And we're working on a band. Yeah. Okay. yeah. We're working on a band. I'm working on some food trucks. Um, wow. It's in, and we're, we're we're looking at it. Did you come when we a couple of years ago when we had our fifty sock hop in the jitterbug contest? Yeah, yeah. That's what we're looking at doing. You probably won oh, it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, but yeah, so we're looking at doing the fifty sock hop, having a jitterbug. We're looking to get some judges for the jitterbug. Oh. So yeah, they actually were meeting today while I was getting ready for this mm -hmm. and coming here. So that was one of the topics for the staffs. Uh, discussion today. That's cool. So, yeah. It's fun. It was a lot of fun, oh, yeah. wasn't it? Yeah. And that's something different that we're going to try to do because we were Thursday nights. And you probably saw over the years, like sometimes attendance goes down, it goes up. Yeah. So um, we were speaking with a couple of the bands and they were like, why don't y'all try Friday? And in the past, mm -hmm. we've kind of been respectful because normally it was the council on Thursday, the American Legion on Friday, the VFW on Saturday. And my person that's over the dances goes, I want to do Friday. And I'm like, I'll support you in whatever you feel you want to do. And so she wants to, so April Fool's, April 1st is April Fool's, mm -hmm. is a Friday. Hopefully the joke's not on us. <laughs> so that's what we're shooting for. And we'll hopefully have some information going out by the end of the week for that. 
So yeah. If you, can they you, going and dancing yeah, anywhere you, right can now? Can you let Palmer? Well, we're going to the VFW. Y'all do? Okay. Yeah. Good. But it's you know it's kind of shut down. Yeah, I know, I know. They, go out and see, they, and that was one of those things, somebody came to me, they're like, the BFW opened up and they're full steam. And I was yeah. like, I know, but they're not under the governor like we are. Yeah. And then they had to scale back again. <laughs> so we we were just taking it slow and easy. Yeah. Um, I have- you let know whenever you start back up? Mm -hmm. or what? Yeah, um, and if y'all are on Facebook, I don't know if y'all do Facebook, we do have a Facebook page of the Council on Aging and that's where we're keeping stuff posted. But um, I have, being in Bossier, we had that big thing over there called Barksdale, you know? So uh, we have a lot of military influences. So we have been applying the kiss it method and our kiss it method is keeping it simple and significant. Mm -hmm. And so as we're doing things, that's what we're looking at is how can we build back this and start something slowly rather than just kind of go in full steam ahead. So we're, we're kissing everything we, we do right now. <laughs> so, well, thank y'all so much. And 